Hi everyone and welcome to my virtual performance tutorial. Uh, this video is going to be in five parts and you'll be able to access each section just by checking in the description. There's a link to each part there. It's going to start at the very beginning and take you all the way through the whole procedure from when you first drag in your play along track to make for your students or whoever to play all the way to the end where you'll have your full performance done in Final Cut Pro, all your videos on one screen. Uh, check the description. There are a few links in there that are going to be really useful for you. Uh, one is a Google Doc that outlines the whole procedure and with detailed instructions on how this is done. You're going to want to have that with you when you watch the video so you can follow along with it. It coincides right alongside the video for the most part. Uh, the other is another link to a YouTube video. And in the description of that video, there's a link for a plugin called the Simple Grid X Pro Pack, I believe. And that plugin is really useful. You are going to need it when you work on the final cut section of this video. So just follow those links and get that plugin, download it, and put it on your computer, please. Uh, that You should have everything you need with all of that. So hope this helps you out. Uh, it's centered towards more of a beginner, somebody who's just getting into this stuff like I was just a few months ago. So I hope it helps you. And I hope you make a great virtual performance and understand how to do it better uh, after seeing it. All right, take care and enjoy the video. First part of this tutorial is going to be on adding a count off to your play along track. So the track that you decide that your students or peers or whoever are going to play along to, to capture their performance, you need to import that into Logic, and then you need to add a click or a count off to the track. So I have Logic open here. I'm going to go to an empty project, and it's going to bring up this screen, and you can just hit Create. You don't have to worry about adding any inputs or audio channels or anything. You're only going to have one in there, and that's all you're going to need for now. So here's what my screen looks like in Logic. I've got audio one here, you know, one track, it's empty. I'm going to take my play along track and drag it in here. So drag it in, I'll put it all the way at the beginning for now, which is fine. Right? And it will load and then it'll come right in there. And there it is, right? So there's my play along track. This is what the kids are going to be playing with. So you get the idea right there. There's the track and it goes on for a little bit. This is just a segment of this particular song. So once that's in there, I need to add a click to it. Uh, and how you do that is you have to figure out the tempo of the song, at least the tempo of the song at the beginning. So first thing you're going to do is take your track and drag it to about measure three. Now it's not starting right at measure three because if you can see, by the way, if you zoom in, which over in this corner where my mouse is here, I can zoom in a little bit. There's a little bit of space. So we're going to have to finagle with it uh, after we find the tempo. So right now, this track, this temp, the tempo of this logic file is 120 BPM right here, the top of the screen in the middle. It's right there. You need to figure out the general tempo of the beginning of the song. And what you'll use to do that, or what you can use to do that, is a metronome app that has a tap function. So a function on a metronome app where you tap it and it tells you the tempo you're tapping. And you're just going to play the file. By the way, spacebar plays, or right up here, this plays, uh, the play icon there. And you're gonna tap along to your metronome app, try to figure out what it is. Let it go for a little bit, restart it often. Don't let it go too far into the song. A lot of times, live players, I mean, they're not going to play the same exact tempo all throughout. And you're really just giving them something so that they come in at the beginning together. So I would play this track. would stop it and I would play it again and again and again all the while tapping on my metronome trying to find the general area of where the you know the tempo is supposed to be so after messing around with it for a little while I figured out that this particular song is at about, at about 94 beats per minute and it's a little tricky because it's actually in cut but 94 beats per minute works just fine for me for this song i go up here to where this tempo is and i double click on the 120 and i change it to 94 i hit enter and now you'll see that you know it looked like my file stretched out a little bit this it didn't really it's just uh the tempo of the song changed so now this is truly bar three 
and we've moved this generally where bar three is, we're gonna add a count off beforehand. Now we can move this closer now if we really want to. I mean, I can zoom in, you know, pretty good here, and I can see where it is. And the farther you zoom in, the more particular you can get and move the wave generally there, and then zoom out a little bit more. It's nice to have more workspace. I mean, you can do that if you want. You're still going to have to use your ears because you're, you're not dealing with absolute tempos here, right? Just because you feel like it's 94 because you're metronome and app, I mean, it could be 94.2. It's not an exact science. It's not exactly when this very first thing shows up, you know, is exactly 94 BPM or whatever. So now I'm gonna add my count off. And to do that, I need to find the sound. And if we're gonna find, go into this loop icon right here. It's gonna bring up all the Apple's loops. And where it says search loops, I would like a woodblock sound. So I'm gonna type woodblock here, hit enter. And the very first thing that shows up, at least the very first uh, green one, which is what you need, is the neon, who um, I can't say right, woodblocks 01. I'm gonna take that and I'm gonna drag it underneath the original file here, all right? All the way to the beginning and underneath the original file. And I only need that once, so I can get rid of that loop icon and get all my workspace back. And you'll see there's a whole bunch of stuff here, right? But we only need this, just that one woodblock sound. So here's beat one, I'm just going to, I'm gonna go on this other side, see where my mouse is, I'm gonna click the bottom right corner of this MIDI file here. Green files are MIDI, by the way, blue or live. And I'm gonna drag it over so that it covers just one beat. All right, there it is. It's on one beat of the song. And once you have this, I mean, this is your count off. So you press Command C to copy it, you know, just like you would copy anything else. And you can kind of decide where you want it. So I usually like my count off to go on beat one, then on beat three, then on one, two, three, four. So you notice when I pasted it the first time, I'm not sure if you just saw me do that, it went up on this blue file. You don't want that to happen. I messed up and did that because blue was highlighted right here. See this Pepper's original? I wanted Asian Kit highlighted, All right? So you wanna make sure you have the right track highlighted. So there it is on beat one, there it is on beat three, and then here's one, two, three, four, and then the tune should start. So you're going to have to test this out and mess around with where your file is going to start. Because you're gonna to have to move it left and right in some way or another. Now you can zoom in. The farther you zoom in in Logic, the more control, the more precise you can be as to where you know things are moved. So I'm gonna to listen to it. So it's pretty close right now. So some of you might listen to it and think that it's it's fine and we can move on, and you could. Your kids would probably be fine. Uh, once the recording starts, that's when you know the recording is going to take over and they should be listening to the recording. I thought it was a little early, although it was pretty close. I, you know, it kind of took me by surprise how close it was. We'll try it again. So let's say I really like that and I think that that's great and it's good to go and everyone will start the song at the same time based on that. You have to remember they're going to practice with this count off as well. So even if it's not 100% perfect, they're going to be fine. Now this is the track they're going to use to both practice and learn the song on. So now I've got my count off. I've got my track that they're going to play to. Now I have to export it. But before I do that, I want to make sure I export it at an appropriate volume. Uh, just because if you, you know, it's, it might sound fine to you or to me. Actually, none of it really sounds fine because everything's going through a microphone. But the volume level might seem fine when you listen to it at your desktop or on your screen in headphones. But when you export it, it might seem that it's much quieter. You have to look at the levels. And we're going to get much more later into this, you know, uh, tutorial. We're going to get into all the different uh, faders and things in Logic. But for now, we're only going to look at this guy right here in this spot on the screen. This is the main fader, and we are gonna take a look at where everything is reading. And you can see right away that there's some red showing up there, right? When you see red, that means it's clipping. And it just means that the signal's too much for what the system can handle. So you don't want that to happen. So I'm gonna pull it down a little bit. All right, I'm just gonna move it down a little bit and test it again. So it's still going into the red a little bit. By the way, I mean, it 
it's tough to hear anything on this recording right now, but you can kind of hear clipping. There's like a crunch sound to it. So we'll move it down a little more. So that's pretty good. Now, I just happen to know that on this track, that's the loudest part. So you always want to check it against the loudest part of the track because that's the part the, that's most likely to clip. If you have that loudest part not clipping, the rest of your track is going to be fine. So where I just moved that to, there wasn't really clipping. I got the loudest, best sound I could. So it'll be a lot easier for the kids to hear it in their headphones when they play along with it. So now I've got my count off. I've got my track. I've got it as loud as it can be without you know it clipping it's time to bounce it now so when i bounce it you know, this is just another word for exporting uh, we're going to bounce it i'm going to return my cursor to the beginning of the song so wherever the cursor is here oop, just pull that another thing doesn't really matter you can just click here to return it although the safest thing to do is this guy right here next to the play button all right let me move this over a little bit now this is at the beginning of the song i'm going to select everything by pressing command a and now everything in the song is highlighted. And I'm gonna start the bouncing procedure by pressing Command and B. That's gonna bring up this window. Now your kids don't need a super high quality recording that takes up a bunch of space, uh, just because you're gonna be distributing it to them through the internet or all over the place. So an MP3 will be just fine. I'm not sure what will be highlighted on your screen when you open this up. It might be PCM or whatever. You need to make sure everything is unchecked except MP3. And all of the other settings that are on your screen here should be just fine. So you select MP3, you make sure PCM isn't checked, uh, and you hit OK. And what happens now is you can name it, and then you could save it. So you know you would name it whatever you want. Yeah, and you hit bounce like wherever you save it and then it'll bounce it and it'll show up wherever it is and now you've got an mp3 that your students can use uh, to record with to practice with to make their whole production it all comes from this this first step uh, I'm not going to go into it on the video but if you check in the description there's a whole document that goes along with everything I'm going to cover and there's a section called 1A, getting recordings from your students. You might want to check that over, especially if you've never done anything like this before. It has some recommendations on how to collect the recordings, some ideas on where the phone or camera should be for each instrument, and things like that that might help you out if you need it. It's just not going to be covered on this particular tutorial. It's in the document, though. All right, so that's it for this first part. Now we're gonna move on to the second part, which is where we are going to sync your students' finished recordings uh, into iMovie, and we're gonna have one synced up video and audio. All right, thanks a lot, and I'll see you in a sec. Okay, here we go with part two of this tutorial. We are gonna be syncing your student performance videos and audio up to the track that you just made in Logic. We're gonna use iMovie to do this. So I'm gonna open up iMovie here. There it is. At this step, this is like an extra step that I do. I just like it because when I used to do these things before last year, I was always annoyed because I hate syncing the students' videos to the audio. I just find it so tedious and it drives me nuts. So I was doing it once in Logic for the audio and then once again in Final Cut for the video. So I was syncing them all twice and it was just you know a lot, I couldn't stand it. So I came with this step and we're gonna use iMovie for it. This way you're only going to have to sync everything up once. It's gonna cause you to export a new video but that new video will have the audio and the video synced up with the track right away. So you'll notice you, you open up iMovie and you're going to have to start a new event. There it is. So when you open up iMovie, uh, it's usually going to take you to projects. I was in media there for some reason. But here's your projects. You're going to create a new one. And there's your movie. You don't want to hit trailer, hit movie. And first thing you're going to have to put in here is a black background. So I'm going to go up to backgrounds. I find black right here. So this is the backdrop for everything we're going to do 
is in this background spot. So since I've worked in uh, iMovie before, you know, normally, if you look over here, I'm zoomed in all the way. To really sync these videos up, that's what you're going to have to do. But yours will probably start further out. But you know, here's where you zoom. To the right zooms in, to the left zooms out. It's very useful. Uh, you're really going to need it. Because just like in Logic, when we're talking about adding that track or adding the clip, the more you zoom in, the more precise you can be with your movements. So next we are going to drag in our audio. So the audio, this is what you exported and shared with your students and you added a count off to it in the last step, the logic step. So see, I pulled this over way too far. You want your timeline here or your background to be just about as long as your track, um, you know, give or take, it doesn't have to be perfect. It's just a, a little thing for now. So you'll see this track, the very first thing on here is to click. Oops, you gotta click the button there, my bad. So there's your track, right? Uh, we have it, now we need to add the video that you're going to sync up to. So this will be your first student video, and I recorded myself on five saxes doing something for this demo. So this is the sax parts to this particular song. Here's my sax video, here I am. There I am in the upper corner there, and you know you can see it's scrolling along as it's playing. So I want to sync this video up to this audio because you can hear right now. It's not synced. All right, so I happen to know that because I know this music that the sax comes in on beat one. So I could see right here where my audio is starting, and then here's all the background noise and stuff. We will get rid of that later on. So I'm gonna click right there. See, so when I click right there, you know, there's a line, right? I'm going to press, while this is highlighted, this saxophone track, I'm gonna press Command and B, and you'll see that there's a break now, and this stuff before is highlighted. So you can click on it to make sure it's highlighted, hit Delete, and now it's gone. By the way, you can do this another way if I you know, undo everything I just did. If you click on the left side over here, you can pull it. You know, left and right to add more or get or you know take away some and even if you add that break or uh, command b stand for blade and delete it you it's still there you could pull it over and get it back so now i can move this around and i can find it so once again i said you're going to zoom in all the way for this process right so i'm going to click here and that leaves that cursor there and i'm going to zoom in a whole bunch so when you're zoomed in you can see I, it's so it's clear as day. Here are the clicks. One, two, one, two, three, four. And this is about where the song starts. So I click there, and you see it leaves, when you click, it leaves a line there for you as a point of reference. I'm going to take this. I'm just going to try to drag my entrance as close to that line as I can. Now, it might take a few tries. It, it may or may not. We'll see how this goes. It's a guess and test procedure. <laughs> So it feels pretty good to me, but if I, just in case I'm a little ahead, I'm going to move it over to the right one click and see how that does. All right, so I feel that that's pretty good. Now, you may not get it that quick. I've just done this. I did my virtual concert not too long ago, and I went through this process hundreds of times already. So I, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with it. It might take you longer to guess and test with it. You may have kids that come in at different times. You know, everybody coming in at the beginning of a song certainly makes it easy, but your trombones or whatever other instrument might not come until later. You gotta find that spot in the track. So even though that was pretty quick, you know, you'll know, you get there if you're not used to doing it yet. You, you get much better as it, as it moves along. So I'm gonna take my track, and you see I just pulled it all the way back to the beginning. Now I know I'm covering, like, my, my video is gonna show up at the very beginning and I can get rid of it later in Final Cut if I want. Now you can see that my track extends past, you have this like little thing of me, you know, I'm done, I stop the track I played to, I reach, I turn it off. If you want all that there, you just have to make sure your timeline goes a little past your track. If I didn't want it, if I thought ah, nobody needs to see me turn the camera off there, you know, I would stop it here, I would I'd put that point of reference there and I'd pull this over. 
and then I would, you know, you want your black background to go a little past, and then the video would just end there. Whichever you want, it doesn't matter. You're just, you're going to have to look at it. All right, and make sure everything's there. Also, what you do during this process, if you're a teacher and you're, you, this, you're doing this with students, you should listen to the whole video. And I know that might be annoying, but there's so many things you can take note of while it's going on. I mean, kids, kids they're, they're kids, right? They don't realize that their dog running in the background is going to be a problem sometimes, or their dad going by in a lawnmower. You know, that might get in the way of their video, right? So you want to listen to the whole thing for any kind of a, things that shouldn't be there and take notes. Or even if there's like a really bad entrance or something you might want to fix later, you want to take notes and you can use it to help give the students feedback if you want. But you, know, there, you may be surprised if you line up the beginning and go, okay, great. Then you go to the end and you go, oh, okay, great. And in the middle, somebody comes in and turns on the TV in the living room and, and you're really surprised at the next step of this. I would just listen to the whole thing, take notes of any kind of thing that might seem weird that you need to change and get that ready. All right, so now video synced, everything's here. We're going to export this file you know, as a new video. So you want the playing of the student or me here on this, not the track. So I'm going to delete it. So you click the track down here on the left, press delete and it's gone. So now even though this track is gone and this count off isn't here anymore, because we started the timeline where the track started at the beginning, the, the exact amount of time it takes for that count off to happen is still there. So no matter how many videos we do with this process, if you do it this way, when every video export will start at the same exact spot where that first count was, whether you're doing the audio and logic or whether you're doing the actual video combination in Final Cut at the end, you're gonna have a video that works for both. So you don't have to keep syncing it. It's ready to go now, everything seems fine. I go up here in the upper right corner to the share button and you're gonna to go to export file. And you're going to want to name this by like the section, personally. Like, you know, I mean, whatever section you want and then some kind of identifier, of, you know, however, or however you wanna do it. Because when you import these into Logic or Final Cut, you're going to wanna to do it by section, like by instrument section or vocal part or whatever. You want to make sure you have some identifiers on there so that's easy. As a matter of fact, I would recommend saving them all into you know particular folders that's organized that just makes things easy. Because now you, you're, you're just going to have so many files on your computer. So there, fine. We have this, sax is out to one. You don't need a description. You don't need any tags for this. Uh, you want video and audio as your format. Your resolution, the best you can do is usually great. 1080p is fine. There's no real reason to go past that. Best ProRes for your quality. And I always compress for better quality. You can compress for faster. I, to be honest, I don't really think there's a difference. So I have that there, and then I'm going to export it. I have a folder called Demo Exports, and you know, it'll take time to export. You see this window right here? It's loading and it'll tell you how long it's gonna take. When it fills up, it usually plays a little ding, and you know you're done. So wait for that, it looks like it's gonna be about five seconds. So once this finishes, which will happen right now, all right, we have it in our folder, wherever you want it to store it, and it's time to bring in your next video. So what you're gonna to need to do, there's two ways you can go about this. Uh, me personally, I just delete this, I leave the background and I drag in a new video wherever it is, right? I mean, I already did this tenor one, but I drag it in and then you drag in the audio, the new audio again, right? Um, that's, that's how this works. You just keep doing it over and over again. Now you may run into a problem and it's worth mentioning, right? So I would just do the process here again. Some videos you're gonna get are recorded at different frame rates and sometimes that can complicate things because the frame rate of the project is picked by the first video you drag in. So you can, to be on the safe side, create a new project every single time you do this, but it's pretty time consuming and annoying to do that. So I would recommend just go, just keep bringing in new videos on the current project. You'll know when there's a problem.
you'll know uh, that it's slowing down or the pitch is off or it's different or something happened with a frame rate problem, then you would go and start a new project. At least that's what I would recommend. You have to do this process with every single one of your videos that you get from your students. And then once you export it, you can delete the original file they sent you. Because now you have the, essentially the same thing, except now it's synced up and starting at the right time. So that's everything for this step. Uh, next, we're going to work with Logic Pro and we're going to start getting your, your uh, audio performance together. So at this point, you would have gotten recordings from all of your students. You would have matched them up to the original audio that you gave them, re-exported them, and now you're ready to start making your audio performance. The first step of that is right here, part three, importing, editing, and mixing your audio files by instrument section. We're going to import them, bring them all in by section, i.e. like flutes or trumpets or altos if you're a vocal teacher, whatever it is, you're going to want to organize them that way. That's why in the earlier steps on step two, it was so important to get them into specific files by section. You're going to do the same thing when we do the video performance or the video part of this, uh, the last step. So it's really good to have all of your files organized. You're going to open up Logic Pro. You're going to actually open up the file where you made your track at the beginning, where you added the click. So you see here's our click, our count off, here's our track. This is the same file we were using before. It's opened and it's ready to go. Now you're going to bring in a section of instruments. Now for this tutorial, I have five saxes from uh, Chili Pepper 101, I believe the song is, so I recorded that. So I'm just gonna treat it like a low sax section here, uh, not like a whole band section. I'm gonna take three files, the Barry Sax, the Tenor One, the Tenor Two, and I'm gonna drag them right into Logic. You'll see it's gonna ask you some questions. It, first of all, open the movie is going to be checked when you get this. You wanna make sure it's unchecked. You don't wanna open a movie, you just wanna extract the audio track and hit enter for okay or click okay. It's gonna ask you the same question once for every instrument you import. I think it remembers your answer. Well, it definitely did there, right? So you just need to hit okay as many times as you need to. You're gonna notice, first of all, because we did that whole thing in step two, where we synced everything up to the track together, when we pulled this video in, it's already synced up. I mean, it may not be perfect. I mean, there's human error and everything, but you could see, if I zoom in, I mean, it's starting right about where that track is starting. So everything's already synced up. You're not gonna to have to do it again, uh, unless you wanna really fine tune it. But you're not going to be able to move it. So see, I clicked if I want to move it to the right. Look, it's over there, right? This is very frustrating, whatever, right? We need to fix that. Let's see, you have this lock over here, this little lock icon. We got to get rid of that. Logic doesn't want you messing with the timing of these videos because it's synced up to a video. I'm sorry, this audio because it's synced up to a video. You need to allow yourself the permission to do that, which it makes you, you have to enable advanced tools. So as Logic Pro up here. I go to preferences and I go to advanced tools. Now, if you've never, if you haven't done this step yet, show advanced tools won't be, you know, there won't be a check in the box. I check it off. All these come up. You just hit enable all. We're all professionals here. Yeah, we can, we'll be fine. Enable all, get rid of this box. Now you're going to be able to take the option to get rid of the lock. So I click on all three tracks. You can do it there. You could do it here, wherever they're all highlighted. I right click anywhere on there. And this option wasn't, wouldn't have been here before you enabled those advanced tools. This SMPTE lock, you wanna click unlock and it's gone. Now I can move these around as I see fit you know, on here. After you do that, you wanna make sure the track is all the way to the left. I mean, I, it was already done here. You could tell because it was lined up, but make sure each track is pulled all the way over to the left since the first thing that happens is the count off and the click. It's all there and this should be pretty together right now. Now, because I recorded, I'm the same person that recorded all these things with the same camera, the same microphone, this problem or this issue I'm gonna go over next isn't something that is gonna really apply. 
But because you're getting recordings from all different kinds of players, all different experience level, all different rooms, microphones, phones, angles, your wave files might look drastically different from one another. So some wave files might be tiny, some wave files might be huge and take up the whole screen. What you want to do is balance them. Make them about the same size, all of the instruments in your section. So first you would find a good healthy wave file. Now any of these would be candidates for that. They're not too big, they're not too small, right? But, and you're gonna go, when you click one, right? Say I click here, this tenor one thing. Right? Over here on the side, you're gonna see something called gain. Now if you don't see it, it's just because this eye isn't clicked. So click that eye right there and you can see gain. As long as I'm clicked on this track right here, this is a tracks gain I'm going to affect. I'm going to gr grab my mouse right to the right of the word gain. And if I pull it down, you'll see that the wave starts to shrink because I'm lowering the gain. And if I pull it up, I can make the wave obnoxiously huge. So you, just by dragging down and up, you can change the, the size of the wave. You want to pick a file with a good healthy wave or make one have a good healthy wave and conform the others to it. And it should then bring them to about the same volume. It's not an exact science and it doesn't have to be. It's just some of the files you get from your students, the wave is going to be so tiny. If you wanna zoom in on just the waves kinda, of, you can click this icon over here and it makes them bigger. It doesn't make them louder, it's just as if they're closer to you, so they're bigger. Once you have all the waves bounced, it should be, everything should be at about the same volume. And you're gonna wanna check. You're gonna wanna really check these tracks over, especially if you mess with the gain. Sometimes it doesn't come out sounding too great. You wanna listen to each track individually, all different parts of it. And to do that, you can use the mute and solo tool. So if I click this M here on Barry Sachs, it's gonna mute the whole track. And if I click the S, it's going to solo it so only that track is sounding. You're going to use the original here. You're going to compare all of the tracks together. Now, what's happening here is it's definitely clipping. As you can see, it's in 7.6. That's just because, I mean, when we made this demo track earlier, we made it loud enough. You know, so now we're adding stuff to it. It's going to start clipping. Uh, so you don't necessarily have to listen to them all together. I mean, you could solo just that, and the Barry, even that might clip. So I'm comparing them. But by the way, if it's clipping, it's fine. You could just take your stereo out and drag it down, or your master and drag it down, if you don't like how it sounds. So I'm gonna be listening for all kinds of things on here. Uh, any kind of anomaly sound that shouldn't be there, timing issues, you're just checking it over, or even if you took notes when you were doing step two, I'm gonna be comparing all that stuff together. Now, I can tell you right now, I lost like my attention span is not great. And I'm pretty sure when I listen to my tenor saxes, I was, yeah, it's pretty faint on there, but I'm like singing the song in my rest. So that's obviously a problem, right? So you want to take a look for things like that, and you want to then get rid of them. So I'm going to use the solo function. I'm going to use the mute function, all kinds of things to listen. If I need to zoom in, it's right here in this upper corner, you know, to really get into the nitty gritty of everything. So right away off the bat, you know, I know that I'm going to have to eliminate a lot of the stuff in between the entrances of the tenors because I talked during it. So you're checking the tracks over, you're making sure everything's good. By the way, uh, you can check for clipping or for anything else by looking at the levels. So I'm going to press X on my keyboard and now the mixer has popped up and here's all my tracks, the tenor two, the tenor one. I mean, if you're a stickler for order, all you have to do is just grab the track and drag it and it'll put it wherever you want. The demo track, right? This thing that says Asian kit is the count off and the stereo out, this is like the main thing here. So I'm going to drag this down a little bit even though I'm probably gonna change it later uh, just because I wanna make sure everything isn't clipping. So here I'm listening to everything. So if any 
of these things were clipping, it would you would see red right here. Like here, let's blast the tenor one part up here. So even now it's not clipping, which is actually pretty incredible, but it's telling me the highest point, which is 5-4, it's still in the yellow, it's not clipping. If I uh, move this stereo out up, now you'll see the stereo out track will clip. I've never really tried to make clipping happen before, and I, I seem to be kind of bad at it here. All right, there we go. We got it. We got some red. See how it says 8.7, and it'll, re it'll remember the highest it went and tell you. So if you lose track or you look away and you say, oh, man, it went up to 8.7, it's red, uh, you would click it to get rid of it and move it down, obviously, to a spot where it's not clipping. So after you've gone through, you've listened to it every way, you know that there are issues of some things you may need to fix, uh, you would just take some steps to fixing them. And one of the things you're going to do for that is you're going to use the cut function. So any cuts that you might need to make, right, you're going to do that now. So to get up the cutting tool, right, you just click this arrow right here, and it brings up all the different things. You would click scissor tool. All right, so let's just say I don't really need whatever sound happens at this song, you know, at the beginning. So I would make a few partitions with the scissor tool, then switch back to the pointer tool, click on them all, and now that part is gone on here. As I mentioned before, all of these areas of space, the tenor, <laughs> I, I was like clicking my keys or singing. I don't want any of that there. And if I zoomed in far enough, you'd probably be able to see some of the disturbances. There's some right there, right? Here's another way you can do it. You don't have to use these you know, icons up here. If you press T and then I quickly, T-I, it brings up the cut function. And if you press T and then T, it brings up the pointer function. You can do this real quick. Also, if you click two tracks or multiple tracks, bring up the cut function and decide where you're going to cut, it'll put a cut in both tracks. So I'm just getting rid of all of those things right here. I hear that beep in the background. My dinner is ready. I'm having lasagna. Pretty excited about it. All right, I go there. I make a cut. That makes a partition here. And I just get rid of all of that empty space. Now, you're not going to necessarily have to go into all of your tracks and eliminate all of the empty space. I, I mean, it's going to take you forever if you have a whole bunch of students, but you're going to definitely want to take note when you're listening in step two or when you, or listening again in this step where you're mixing their things of certain stuff. Because I know for a fact that I went a, just lost my train of thought when I was recording this. Uh, I'm pulling, see how I'm pulling these out? I think I took a little too much off or I was worried about it. So everything's always stored there. You, know, you can always get it back. So we'll just say that that's good enough for me right now. Even if I listen to the end here, you can hear all that other stuff. By the way, just like you were doing with the videos, you can bring everything back this way too by clicking the bottom right corner. You can get rid of information that way. So now I've looked over these things extensively. I mean, if this was kids, I would look a lot more. Yeah, you know, but because it's you know me, I'm pretty confident I played everything right, and uh, I'm pretty confident in the performance. So I've made all the cuts that I need to. I've listened to it over and over again. I, I have a general idea. I've matched all of their wave sizes together for to be the same so that they're all about the same volume. And uh, we're gonna change that in a little bit. I'm pretty much ready to move on to the next step. At this point, because I know everything is synced up. Oh, by the way, another thing on cutting, like let's say I had an entrance that was really bad, like a kid came in way late or way early. I mean, you could shave off the part if he came in early. If he comes in late, let's say this was one note. I put a cut on this side, I could move this over to match where his entrance is. That's just another good way to use cuts, you know, or the cutting function in this program. So 
I now know that everything's synced up, everything's together, the section is all here. I'm not gonna really need this demo track anymore, so I'm gonna mute it. Uh, you should keep it there in case you need to go back and check anything over, but the demo track is kind of what you're, you're testing everything against for this whole process. Now that I have that, it's time to start adding some EQs. So let's say I got rid of my mix. This step is optional. You don't have to do it, but it's an easy thing you can do, might make your track sound a little bit better. And at the very least, it gets rid of some of the frequencies that the human ear can't hear and kind of makes things sound a little better uh, just by itself. And you don't have to be an expert. They have presets for everything. So we're gonna add an EQ to each of these tracks. So I'm gonna press X to bring up my mixer. And here they are, here are three tracks. Uh, they're named kind of funny, so I mean, I'm just gonna rename them real quick. By the way, you right click, rename track, All right? This is tenor one. The other way you can get to it is if you just click once, right, right on the letter, you can usually bring it up or double click. There it is, I'm sorry, it's a double click. Tenor two is here, and then here's Barry. It's a lot easier to read them when they're titled, right? So here we go. I'm gonna add an EQ to my tenor one. So I'm gonna go up to audio FX. See this empty area here? You can shortcut this by just clicking this EQ thumbnail, but I'm just gonna show you how to do it through the audio effects. So I click here, I'm gonna add a plugin and I'm gonna add a channel EQ. Now mine's already stored up here. Yours might not be there uh, when you do this. So you're, you're looking for, uh, Dynamics, EQ, <laughs> it's right there. I don't know where I'm, where I'm going here. EQ, right under Dynamics. <laughs> there we go, I lost my train of thought for a second. Channel EQ and Stereo. And now here's a window for my tenor one, the EQ. It's all here, it's a beautiful thing. We're gonna go up to factory default and we're gonna use some of these presets. Now down here in the bottom section, they have presets for everything you need. We're gonna go to horns, we're gonna go to tenor sax, click it and it kind of has a pre-made EQ for your tenor sax. So now my tenor one has the EQ that I'm looking for. I can copy it by the way, since I'm gonna put the same EQ on my other tenor. Now for this one, I showed you how to get there. It took me a little while to find it, but I eventually remembered on through the audio effects plugins, you can shortcut to an EQ just by clicking here on this space. And then what I would do is paste it because I copied the other tenor. So tenor two now is the same EQ as tenor one, which was that tenor EQ. For the Barry, I'll go through it this way. EQ, channel EQ, stereo. Now I'm gonna find a Barry sax EQ, horns, Barry sax. If they don't have, like if you're doing like an English horn or something, you could just try to find an instrument that plays in the general area on the grand staff as an English horn or whatever and use that. Um, you know, just as an equivalent. So now all three saxes are EQ'd. I would listen and check. And so on and so forth. Now there's an EQ on all the saxes. It's a pre-made one, nice and super easy to use. I would recommend doing that. Uh, there are other plugins on here that are really important or really useful that we're not gonna get into because this is more of a beginner's tutorial. Uh, they would be compression. Uh, which it can be found under dynamics, compressor, and then stereo in the plugin section here. Uh, you also have auto tune, which when you click here, you go to pitch correction, I believe is what it's actually called, but pitch and then pitch correction. So pitch, pitch correction, stereo, that'll bring up the whole auto tune function. Uh, you can use that. And there's also panning. So panning is something you would do later on when we make our final mix. But that kind of controls where in the stereo field uh, the instruments are going to sound. <clears throat> and it kind of gives it a more realistic thing. Compression, auto-tune, panning, they're all really, really great tools, really great ideas to research and get a better idea of. We're just not going to get into it in this tutorial. We're going to kind of leave things on a more basic level. All right, so after that's done, it's time to start mixing. So I have my section here, it's all together. And because you know I matched the WAV files, they should be about the same volume, but you're gonna wanna really check. Uh, you're gonna bring up the mixer, which by the way, you can access here, or you can press X 
and it's there. And here are these faders. These are all really important. We're going to mix everything and try to get a good balance. Now, this is just a few saxes. It's not going to really take long. As a matter of fact, since it's all the same person, which is me, they're probably going to be pretty well balanced from the get-go. But you would still mess around with it and see what you can do. So I'm going to listen to this thing a bunch. Like if I was really working on this, I was a full section of students, I'd be listening to this over and over and over again until I got everything exactly how I wanted. Here we go for a little bit. So while I'm listening to this, you know, I would be messing with these faders. I would be bringing down different sections, hearing what it sounds like. There's no tenor there, I know. Right. Yeah, I'm going to bring this up. Yeah, I, so I, personally, I think the battery's a little loud. I'll bring it down. It's also out of tune, so it's driving me nuts. So let's say I listened to this a bunch of times and I messed with these faders for a while until I liked the sound. I had a good section sound, sounded like the section I'm going for, and I'm happy with it. Then I've mixed it and I'm ready to move on to the next step, which is kind of the finishing touch. Once you get to this spot, you're good with how everything sounds. You've added an EQ. If you know a little bit more, maybe you've added a compressor or messed with auto-tune or anything else, you're, you just, you feel really good about everything. Uh, the last step you wanna do is similar to what you did when you made the track, when you added the click. You wanna check for clipping. And you wanna kinda push this to the most you can by moving this file up. Now see, it went into the red, so I knew it was too much. So, and one of the best ways you can do is find the loudest part of the song, which I know for this is the beginning. So I can see when I'm listening to that, I'm pushing the stereo out just about to the brink where it would clip, which is fine. That's that's where you want it. You just never want it to clip. You would know because you would listen to this entire thing. I'm not going to put you through that right now. My sax playing isn't that good. It's not worth listening to the whole thing. But I know for a fact I'm not clipping. And you, with your kids, you're going to want to listen to the whole performance. Make sure there's no clipping. Make sure you're pushing this to as far as you can without it necessarily clipping. Now you're ready to move on to the next step. And this is where you have to make some decisions. First of all, if I was really doing this to the very first thing I would have done back in the beginning was move these down so that my click is, you know, separating my files from here or my count off. But I would work this way, no doubt. Uh, so if you are putting plugins on every single one of your tracks, if you keep using the same logic file to import everything in, and you may have 80 students, you may have more than that, I don't know, you're going to overwhelm your computer. It's going to run out of resources. So what you can do to avoid that, well, first of all, the best thing to do is to utilize something called busing. And we're not going to get into busing for this tutorial. Once again, it's a more basic tutorial. So instead of going through busing and all of that, how it works and how to set it up, there are other tutorials you can look at to understand those concepts. Uh, you can just export this whole file, right? You want to make sure when you do that, that this is muted, your original track. You don't want that anymore. You would keep the click, actually, the count on. You can export this whole file and then save it somewhere. And I would save it as like, you know, tenor sax or lower sax, whatever. You're going to do this by section. So trombones, trumpets, you would export each one of these as its own WAV file. And I'm going to get into how to do that in a second. I'll take you right through that. But if you weren't going to go in that direction, you wanted to keep all of the files in your computer, you know your computer can handle it and it's good, you're gonna wanna use something called a track stack. So what a track stack does is it just combines a bunch of tracks into one folder and gives it its own fader for them all together. So you have these three, we like how they're mixed. I'm gonna click on them all and it's, so I have them all highlighted now. I press shift and I'm gonna right click anywhere to create track stack. So I have this now, you're gonna to wanna to make a folder stack, which should be automatically, you know, the first choice you have. 
hit create, and now you see they all disappeared. They're all in this stack, which is called sub one. one. I would rename it, I don't know, low saxes or whatever you want to name it. Uh, if you click this arrow, there they all are. You can see them all. You know, we're just compacting them into this one folder, and I can control their fader here. You can see right here, low saxes. Here's their fader. I can control the sound of them all together. So it's essentially the same thing as exporting the whole thing. So I'm actually going to get rid of this track stack to show you the export. So I'm undoing everything. So if you don't want to do that, you don't want to use track stacks, which my system I normally work on can't handle everything. So I, I do this step. I export each section as its own WAV file, and then later on I combine them all together to make my final mix. Uh, that way you're only working with like a few files, maybe 10, 12 at most, because each one is a section. So you're going to need to export from Logic. So you're going to go all the way back to the beginning, make sure your cursor's there. You want to make sure your track, your demo track is muted, but you want to keep the click. Right, keep the count off. You press Command A, that selects everything. You press Command B, that starts the bounce function. Now, before we bounced, we made an MP3 because it didn't need to be super high quality for what we were using it for. Now, we're going to want to make a WAV file, which is the highest quality file you can export. You want to make sure you click PCM, nothing else, and that your file format is set to WAV. Most of the other stuff doesn't really matter. You click OK, and then you pick where you're gonna, you know, what you're gonna name it. I think we decided on low saxes, and where you're gonna save it. So I'll save it on my desk desktop. I click bounce. It exports. It saves. Now you're going to repeat this. If you're gonna use this method, you have to repeat this whole thing we just did with every one of your sections. All right? You drag each one in, and. Uh, you, know, you might want to save this instead of your track it's something else and keep that organized. You're going to drag each section in, mix it, go through this whole process, and either turn it into a track stack and use the same file, or export the section, start a new file, do the same thing over and over again until you've run through all of the sections in your band or chorus or whatever, and you have each section sounding great, and you're ready to move on. Once you have that, you're ready for the next step, which is where you would create your final audio performance in Logic Pro. We're going to get to that right next, and uh, I'll see you in a sec. This is part four of the tutorial, and this is on creating your final audio performance. You're going to use Logic Pro for this. So at this point, you made a decision as to whether you were going to import all of your tracks as one file in track stacks, or you did a separate file for each section and exported what, them as a WAV file. Uh, either way, it's going to be the same from here on out. If you use track stacks, you would still be in the same uh, logic file as you've been working with throughout. And you would have a bunch of track stacks here, all closed. You know, the arrows should be closed, so not all the tracks are showing, just the stack, the submix. And you would have labeled them a section name. If you had exported individual logic files into a section, just a WAV file for each section, you would drag all of those waves in here and see how this count off is here. Uh, this is all mine because this is the original. You would have information here and that would be the count off on each of those tracks. It's not here because I'm just using some different recordings. I've recorded myself playing uh, 30 bars of a song, just the sax parts of a jazz band tune. So whichever, it doesn't matter. I just have one instrument, not whole sections for the purpose of this tutorial, you would have entire sections of instruments represented in these tracks over here, uh, whether they were track stacks that were closed or individual WAV files. So I have Alto 1, Alto 2, Tenor 1, Tenor 2, and Barry. And it's all gonna be the same whether you use track stacks or whether you use individual WAV files from here on out. You'd have the sections here. They'd be good, healthy waves because you balance them all. And the first thing you're going to look for is clipping, which is going to happen. Now, even just this five tracks by themselves, it's going to clip. So I'll bring my 
you know, cursor over here, and I'm going to open up the mixer by pressing X. And I'm going to hit the space bar, and you'll see down here, the tracks might be okay. They might not be clipping, but the stereo out will probably be going bonkers with the amount of input going in. So let's take a listen and watch. So you can see right here. So you can tell right here on the stereo out track, it's clipping badly up to 9.7. So you can click, so it'll always show you how bad it's clipping and you can see the red here. So I know it's clipping. So I'm gonna get rid of that. And I know I have to make some adjustments. So rather than going to the stereo out first, I'm gonna look to the individual tracks. You should select them all. So I, you know, I select out to one and then I hold shift, I select the rest and that gets everything. All is one thing, I can let go of shift. And now I'm gonna move this slider down. So you should try to move it down to about negative 6.0. That's a good ballpark range. See, I just did that. I can also type it. Like if I type negative 8.0 here, it would bring them all down to negative 8.0. I'm gonna go negative 6.0. You might find that easier than dragging the slider down. Now, just to be sure, you should also pull down the master track. Because So right now, I drug all of these tracks down, all these sections, let's say, down. And now I have room for my volume changes. I can, by the way, click off to reset that so you don't move them all together. I have all this room to make the Barry Sachs louder, and I have all this room to make it softer. Whereas before, there wasn't a lot of space for me to go louder. You're going to also want to move down the stereo out track just because you're probably going to move these up again and we want to stop it from clipping beforehand. You should move it down to about negative 12.0 right about there or once again you can type it. So now when I play it again and check we shouldn't be dealing with any clipping, any red at all. And you could hear, so there's no clipping, which is great, but it's much softer and it could be louder. It's just my output on my actual speaker is low because everything's going into one mic. So that's why it sounds softer on here. So you want to check your song over for clipping, any other issues that might show up. And the best part to check for clipping is the loudest part of the song. If you can control that, everything else will be under control. I just happen to know that in this tune, the loudest part recorded is the opening phrase here. So I check that and I know it's good. So I'm ready to move on. Next, I'm gonna go and mix the levels, like the volume level of each track. So what'll happen is you'll listen to the performance here. Here, I'll jump in a little later. And it should sound pretty good. So I know it sounds okay, and I'm actually gonna move my volume up a little bit here just to make sure you can hear it a little better. So to me, that sounds fine, and maybe to you too, and that's just because of the instruments I'm using. I'm, I'm only using five saxes, but you might be using all different kinds of instruments, right? You, you'll have flutes, you'll have clarinets, trumpets, trombones, if you're mixing a band. And what will probably happen now when you listen to it is, though it might sound pretty good, it's gonna sound unbalanced, because your flutes are gonna be just as loud as your trumpets, which just isn't practical. So you're gonna wanna go and listen to this you know, you're recording many times and adjust these faders down here to make it sound like a balanced ensemble. And it takes some time. Uh, you're gonna have maybe 10, 12, who knows how many sections you're gonna have. You're gonna have a lot of adjustments to make until to your ears it sounds like a section. So I'll play this and I'm just gonna say, I, I know right now my altos are usually stronger than my tenors and my barry is usually a little weaker than everything. So I would adjust these to try to sound like that. So here, I'll show you, I'll play it and I'll start adjusting these to make it how I want it.
So for example, that's how I like it. I think my altos are a little louder. You can see right here, the alto one is pumping pretty loud. And then alto two is a little softer. My tenors are a little softer than them. And I moved my Barry down. I felt like I moved it down too low. So even though my Barry player tends to be a little softer than my tenor players, I moved them up some more. And I can still see, even though they're low, you can see the signal's pretty good. So they're getting a good sound. You can, once again, you could solo it and listen and make sure. You know, I know that it's all heard and happening. And one really good way is you can really adjust it by moving the track all the way down so it's not even audible and then gradually moving it up until it fits in the rest of the section or the band or the orchestra or whatever you're recording and then move on to the next one until it sounds like nice and cohesive and the band at a regular level to you represents what it should sound like. You know, my flutes are gonna be weaker than my trumpets, obviously. My clarinets are gonna be weaker than my alto saxes in terms of volume. So you get a good bass line. And it might take many, many tries to get that. You'll have to listen to your track a bunch, all the while adjusting and making sure you're never clipping. You never see any red. That's the real key. Because when you play that, there's a crunch or a sound somewhere that really isn't natural, it shouldn't be there. You, you want to avoid clipping at all costs. After you get that, right, you're going to start to consider if you want to use automation. So automation is a visual representation of volume in, in Logic. So uh, to use it, it's usually best to close out your mixer so you have some more room to work. And I'm going to press the A key and that's going to bring up my automation menu. So I don't know if you could see, but if you get in pretty close, there's a little line here going across on all these tracks. And that's the volume of the track, the, uh, the input or the volume that's happening. And you can change that with automation so that it changes in the middle of the song, not just the whole track. So let's say you want to bring out maybe some dynamic contrast that's happening with your players, but you want it to sound more exaggerated. It's pretty typical just because of the way these are recorded, right? Like everybody's recording in different rooms in a house. So they're not actually playing together and able to adjust to each other. So you may need, if you want to bring it out, uh, to accent it with some automation. So there isn't really a great spot in this song, but I'll try to find So let's see, how about right here? So when I go to here, I, maybe I want this to decrescendo. They were supposed to decrescendo. They tried their best under the circumstances, but it didn't really happen. So I'm gonna use automation to put more of a decrescendo in this little section here, but you're always gonna wanna add nodes. Well, you will add nodes. So when I click here, right, on this spot, Boom, I just added a node. You may have to click twice. And at the end, I'm gonna add another node. And this is like the area you're gonna work with, right? You should always add two nodes. And the reason for that is you're gonna mess with the volume in the inside nodes here, not the outside, because that's your regular baseline volume. You always wanna be able to return to that if you're messing with this. So I'm gonna quickly add two nodes on each sax part here working my way around or down each track. And what I'm gonna do when I'm done is I'm just gonna take those inside nodes and work with the area in there. So automation will smoothly, uh, smoothly transfer volume, change volume, I should say, between nodes. So let's just say I wanted this to decrescendo. So I would take this node, this inside node here, and I'm gonna bring it down so now the alto one, the alto two, here's tenor one, they're all gonna decrescendo. And you don't wanna take it down too far because it'll just disappear altogether, but that's how it's gonna work. So now, instead of everything being at the same volume, we should hear a little decrescendo here. And then it returned to its normal volume here. If I bring up the mixer, you'll see all of the faders automatically move when it gets there. And then they jumped back up to where they're supposed to be. So that's the basic, I mean, that's how you can use automation 
if you want in your music. It's an optional thing. Uh, if you get amazing recordings from your kids where they're really showing dynamic contrast, you won't have to do it much. Uh, that's, I mean, that's really the goal that you're going for. But if you want to bring out some of those dynamic changes, automation is a really good way to do it. You're just going to have to listen to it a bunch of times and experiment. All of these nodes translate to volume changes and numbers. So remember when you input these numbers here and change them, you can see the number that it's going to. You might want to make it like the same amount for everybody. It's up to you how you want to manage it. It's just an option. I'm actually going to get rid of all the automation I just put in just because for the purposes of this piece, there, there doesn't really need to be any dynamic change there. I didn't really pick a song that had much dynamic contrast, so I just undid everything with a Command-Z a bunch of times. When you're done using automation, you can press A and it'll close it out, which is a really good idea so you don't accidentally automate a song, like click somewhere and all of a sudden your volume's all out of whack. You want to avoid that, obviously. So that's automation. Uh, that's, so that's something that's optional. The, the next thing you can do that is also optional is add reverb to your track. So uh, here's my ending here. So now I want to add some reverb. And the way you can do it, you're going to use the stereo out and you're going to add a plugin. So here under this audio FX section, I'm going to add a plugin and I'm going to add some reverb. And one of the best ways, here's reverb right here, is to use the space designer. So you go reverb, space designer, stereo. And that's going to bring up this whole reverb interface here that you, we're not really going to get into. You can use presets for reverb, and Space Designer is a real good way to experiment, just like you did when you used presets for the EQ in the last part of the, of the tutorial. So I like the uh, wooden chamber preset, let's say, for example. I think it's a good safe reverb. So you'll see down here, everything's organized. They have all different kinds of spaces, rooms, halls, you know, small spaces, medium spaces, large spaces. This uh, Space Designer plugin is a really good way to experiment with reverb because they have kind of real life rooms that they try to emulate. So Wooden Chamber is in small spaces and it's in room and it's right here, uh, 0.3S Wooden Chamber. So when I click that, it's now adjusted this reverb interface to try to make it sound like it's in a wooden chamber and you'll hear the difference. <laughs> So now, you know, it just added a little bit of reverb on everything. If I click this here, if I didn't like it, I can just get rid of it by keeping everything, but just kind of muting it with this power button here. So here's what it sounds like without it. And then here it is with it. So it just adds a nice little bit of reverb. You can also mute it right here by clicking this on the track, on the stereo track. That'll stop reverb from happening, which by the way, you could do that with any plugin. There's usually this power button and you can get rid of all of that. So it's, it's fun to experiment with reverb. A lot of the presets are very harsh, I would say. It's tough to find one that just has just a little bit of, little bit of reverb. Uh, and it's tricky just because once again, your kids are, recording in all different spaces. They're not all going to one studio using the same kind of mics and the same everything. They're in different rooms of their house. They're at different places away from the uh, microphone or the camera. So reverb can be a little tricky, but wooden chamber is like a nice safe one in my opinion. So you feel free to experiment with that and just listen to everything. Once you have everything like how you like it, you think it sounds great, you're ready to export, you want to do kind of the same thing you did in the very first part of this tutorial where you boosted the track. So in the first part of the tutorial, we used the master track to boost it. Now we're going to use the stereo out. You're not really going to touch this master track, which is here. It's also represented up here. Uh, we're going to boost the stereo out and make sure that this recording is as loud as it can be without clipping. Right? That's just the best way to export it. And to, to first test you want to run is on the loudest part of the song. Because once again, if you can control the volume there, it'll be balanced anywhere else. You know, it's not going to clip. If it doesn't clip at the loudest part, it won't clip at a softer part. So here 
here we go. We got this. I'm going to play the track and I'm going to boost up this stereo out. I'm going to listen to this opening line where I know everything's really loud. I'm going to zoom out a little bit so you can see the whole thing. And here we go. So you can see as in part of that, it clipped. It went to 1.8 here and it went too too loud, way, much too loud. So I'm going to just clear that and I know that that was around here. Right there. So I know that part, it's it's going too loud. So let's move it down just a little bit. You got to guess and test and experiment. So I got it down to 0.4. I'm going to bring it down a little more. Here we go again. So pushed into the yellow, uh, but not the red. So I'm happy with that. I think that that's fine. I would listen to the rest of the song and just the altos there pushed it. So maybe that wasn't the loudest part of the song at the beginning. That's why it's good to listen to the whole thing. Going to scooch this down a little more. So we don't really need to listen to the whole thing. It's it's all fine and that's great. It's not clipping and I feel that I boosted the stereo out to an acceptable level where it's not clipping but it's still as loud as it can be. Once you've done that, you're now ready to export your final master logic file as a WAV file so that you can use it for your video creation portion of your project. And I'm gonna take you through that in a second. Just one more thing before I do that. Uh, you'll notice I did one last check for clipping and for sound and balance. You want to do that. You want to listen a few times. You want to do that after you've done everything to your tracks. You've got your EQs on it. You've added your reverb, any other effects that you've done. You, you want to check again because reverb even can mess with the volume level. So you want to make sure the very last thing you do after everything is over, check for clipping and check for that sound. You, you don't want clipping on your final product. So now we are going to export this whole file now that I like it and I think it's ready to for a performance. I think it's great for, you know, and I'm gonna include the, the uh, count off when I do this. See, this count off is still here. Back from when I first created it in the first step of this tutorial. So the count off's there. And you're, you'll notice probably on your tracks, you'll have information here and the count off will be there too. That may sound annoying, but you need it to make sure everything still syncs up when you drag your master audio track into Final Cut to make your videos. It'll still sync up with your videos. You're gonna get rid of this later on. If you're exporting for like listening purposes, you would want to like get rid of it. So you would delete this and you would delete any of the information before here. Remember, you can do that. I'll do it over here just to show you. Like if I wanted to get rid of this open section here one last time, I would bring my cursor to where I wanted it out and I would click holding shift. Oops, there we go. On this track, I hold shift and then I click on this track. So I have both tracks highlighted. Press TI to bring up your cutting tool and click where you want it. It just made a cut there, and I would go over here and do the same spot. Click TT to bring up the pointer tool, highlight both, press delete, and now it's gone. All right, so you know, it's just a good idea. You would just do that at the beginning of the song. So I like everything I got, it's wonderful. I'm gonna bring my cursor back to the beginning of the song. You can do that here. If you're ever not at the beginning of the song, right next to play, you hit that little button there, it'll bring you back. And you want to definitely make sure if you have your demo track in your final you know, production or if you want to use it to still check things, you want it muted because you don't want that track. You just want your performers uh, in the end product. So it's cursors back to the beginning, demo tracks muted. I press Command A, that highlights everything. And now we start the bouncing process. Command B, we're here again. 
Uh, you may have MP3 highlighted or something else. You, you want PCM highlighted. You want this to say WAVE. It, it may default to AIFF, I'm not sure. You want it to say WAVE. WAVE files are the largest but highest quality audio files you can export. I click OK. I pick what I'm going to name it. I'll say Final Performance, maybe. And I decide where I'm going to export it to. I think I have like a little demo thing there. Yep, there, I'll put it in there. And you click Bounce. And now it'll read everything and it will save a file on your desktop or wherever you decided to put it, name that. And that is your final master track. You're all done with your audio editing. Now I did this with five saxes. You're probably going to do it with multiple sections of instruments at this point because you exported those sections as WAV files or they're all, they would all be here as track stacks. I just don't have the capabilities of recording a full band performance for you. So I went with saxes, that's the instrument I play. You're all done, it's exported. Now you're ready to move on to the last part, which is using Final Cut to create your video performance. You're gonna add this audio track to it. Everything will be synced up and I'll show you how to manage all that in a second. So I'll see you in the next part. Everybody, welcome to the fifth and final part of this concert virtual performance tutorial. Uh, this is on creating your video performance, your final video performance uh, for your piece. And this is all gonna be done in Final Cut Pro, which is open right now on the screen. Uh, but before you do that, before you open Final Cut, you're gonna wanna download the Simple Grid X Pack, which is a plugin we're gonna be using during this part of the tutorial. Uh, under the description on this video, you should see a link to another YouTube video where you can download the Simple Grid X Pack. It's in their description. Uh, you want to download it. It's a zip file. You open it up. There's instructions in the folder for how to install it. It's very easy. You want to have that installed and ready to go uh, so that you can use it in Final Cut. So make sure you do that first. Pause this video if you need to. Uh, find that other video in the description. Go download the Simple Grid X Pack and you'll be ready to go. So assuming you have that installed and also assuming you followed everything in the previous four parts of this tutorial, uh, you should have a master performance file that you made in Logic and you should have all of your videos that you exported in iMovie, in step two on this tutorial, uh, ready to go. You're going to import everything in just a few moments. And so if this is the first time you've opened up Final Cut Pro or ever really used the program, you might get a few prompts when you open it up. They might ask you to name a library, which will have an event in it. The file organization system in this program is really, really great, but it can be a little overwhelming or a little confusing at first. It's broken down into three categories, a libraries, events, and projects. So you have to have a library and it may auto generate one for you and you can rename it. See, I have one here that says Beck Stuff. I have another one here for this, you know, this video. It's called Virtual Concert. I can't remember, tutorial, all right. Uh, and in that I have an event called Final Cut Demo. So libraries, they're like a storage area. It's, it's a whole media database it's going to be of all the files that are associated with the events and projects you work in. Events are just subcategories of your library, and every library has to have at least one event in it. And what you're going to really be working with is the third part, which actually isn't shown right now. We're going to create it, and that's a project. And a project is where you're going to put where you're going to your main work area, where your workspace is going to be. That's what you're going to export at the end. So. I have a recommendation, I mean, it's up to you. I would recommend naming your library, for example, the name of your concert. Is it a winter concert, a spring concert, a Valentine's Day concert, whatever it is. Uh, name your library that, because all the files you're gonna use are gonna be associated with that. Uh, an event, a good example of an event would be the name of your ensemble that's gonna play this tune or maybe some others. And the project would be the name of the song that the ensemble is going to perform. So we're gonna create a project. I'm gonna click on the event here, Final Cut Demo. So here's my library, Virtual Concert Tutorial. Final Cut Demo is the event, and I'm gonna right click on it. I'm gonna click New Project.
When I do that, you're going to get this screen. Uh, it's going to ask you to name it. Uh, so I'm going to name it demo song for the, all right. So it's named. Let's uh, see. You can you can change what event it's in. It's already in Final Cut demo because I right clicked on it. Uh, you want 1080p HD here. Uh, you may your computer may be able to do better, or it may not have 1080p. The best you can get. There's no real reason to go higher than 1080p HD here. Uh, in my opinion, everything else can remain the same or whatever it tells you, but you want to make sure your frame rate is reading 30p. So make, that, make sure that's all in place and click OK. And that's going to create a project for you. Here it is right here. It says demo song. I had already loaded it up, but you can double click on it just to be sure. And here is our workspace. So this area in the bottom, this is your main work area. This is known as your timeline. And I'm, I would break it down into three parts. Uh, right here in the middle, you see this strip that's running across your screen. Okay, this is called your primary storyline. It's like a master track or a main track. Everything that happens, happens because there's something here. If there isn't something here at any part, whatever it is, it doesn't exist. So you're going to want to put something here that is going to be the backdrop of your whole project. And the safest thing for that is kind of like what you did in iMovie in this similar spot. You put a black background there. Before we do that, just anything below this is going to probably be audio, not gonna probably, it's, it's gonna be audio. Any audio files you put in will go down here and any video files you import or drag in, they're going to appear above this strip. And it's just a whole bunch of layers moving upwards. So very first thing you wanna do is drag a black background in. So that's just your palette and everything's gonna go on top of that. So to get a black background, you're gonna go over here to this T right there and you're going to find solids. So you have a whole bunch of different things here, and we'll get into some of them later. But we're looking for solids, and black is under the heading custom. I dragged it there. It goes all the way to the beginning. You can drag it out a little bit if you want. You can see you have some time stamps here, depending on how long your song is. Uh, this is only like 30 seconds, so I'll bring it to about here. Uh, I'll be able to change it later. So now I have a black background down and the backdrop for everything is going to be this black background. So now that that's there, we have something. I mean, it's nothing. When I hit spacebar to play it, you, know, you don't see anything. You just see black because that's all that's there. I'm going to grab my audio, the final performance, the thing you just made in uh, Logic Pro. I'm going to drag it underneath and you want to make sure it's all the way at the beginning. So now, you know, usually it's good to adjust your background to go a little past your farthest file here. When I hit play now, you'll hear the count off, and then you'll hear the saxophone performance of the piece. Lovely. So that's there. And so now you have your backdrop, you have your audio, and now we're going to work with the area on top of this uh, primary storyline where you're going to drag your videos in. And you just want to be careful, especially if you have a lot of videos. Now, I only have five, so this is pretty simple. But if you have a lot, you want to put them in reverse score order, in my opinion. You want to be able to keep track of all the entrants. And if you labeled them when you exported them in iMovie by their section name first, it can be pretty easy to find them. So I'm going to go from the bottom to the top and I'm going to drag my new video files in one by one. So starting with Barry Sachs. I'm going to pull it in here. I'm going to bring it all the way to the left. And you see there I am. All right, that's me on the Barry Sachs, right? So next thing I'm going to do is bring in the second tenor part. And once again, I'm always going to make sure they're as far left as can be because we already timed them in that iMovie section of this tutorial. There's tenor one. We need alto two. It's uh, so the reason why you want to drag them in reverse score order is because uh, I'm strange my ten or two part. I don't know, so there's um, it's just because it's a lot easier to drag on top of everything than it is in the middle or the bottom. So if you do it in reverse score order, you can just get them in there easier. So here we are. Here's my five videos. I drug them all in. They're all pulled to the left, and they're all already synced up to the track because we did that in the st in step two or part two uh, when we uh, synced all those videos up. So here they are, 
And let's just take note of what we got here. We've got our primary storyline, which is a black background. We've got our audio, which is below the primary storyline. And then we've got our five videos. They're all on top of each other. But you'll notice when I scroll through, right, I only see uh, one, just me, playing out to one. That's because these are all layers. They're all stacked on top of each other, and you only see what's on the top stack. Uh, they're all playing or working at the same time, but we're, you know, we're only looking at one. We're going to fix that in a second. But before we do that, you need to highlight all of these guys and get rid of the audio. So each of these files has their audio on them. You don't need that anymore because you already mixed them all together and made a final performance down here. So highlight them all. You can use shift if you want and click on each one individually, whatever, or you can just you know grab them all with a box. Right click on any of them and you're looking for detach audio. Click that. And down below, down here, one's red for reasons I'll never understand. All right, here's all the audio. You want to get rid of them. Highlight them all and press delete. Make sure you don't delete your master performance there. So now when I play this, you'll hear the count off because it's still on that final performance. Oh, by the way, spacebar plays, starts and stops playback. So, but you just see me. Now we have to change that, right? You, you were only looking at one video. We're going to shrink all these videos and put them at different points of the screen so you know we can see everything happening at once. To do that, this is where your Simple Grid X, that plugin, is going to come in handy. I think it's Simple Grid X Pro. We have to access that plugin and we're going to drag it on top here. So that plugin is found that you press the T again, just like you did before if you, if you lost the highlight and you're looking for Mac Studio A Gens here. Right, you click on that and you're looking for the Pro one, not Simple Grid X, but the Pro. Grab it, drag it into your timeline on top of everything and you're going to want to pull this over. So right now you're going to notice that it's going to have to render. So see these dots up here? That means it's rendering. And typically that'll be represented up here on this render screen. Now, there it goes. This guy up here, this guy is like your worst enemy. Uh, you will learn to hate, absolutely hate this icon. So every time you drag a video in or make a change or add text or do anything, your project has to render. Now, I did this with five videos, one audio, and one Simple Grid X. That's not too bad. You may have 80 videos in here, or however many. It's going to take your program a long time to render sometimes, depending on what your computer specifications are. So if you notice that things are starting to not really function, and this guy's taking a while for that circle to fill up, up here, when you drag your videos in, you want to drag it in and mute it. So let's just say I drug in this Barry Sachs, right? Actually, I'll take you through the whole thing again. So there, everything's gone, All right? So I'm going to drag my Barry Sachs in, All right? There it is. The first thing I'm going to do is mute it. Boom. The V button on your keyboard mutes it. And that's going to you know, just make life a lot easier for you. You'll be able to move to the next thing. Here's 10 or 2. It's really easy to get this stuff imported. There's 10 or 2, 10 or 1. Oh, and I would mute that 10 or 2. So boom, press V when I click on it and mute it. 10 or 1, I'll mute that. For whatever reason, my 10 or 2 is having trouble loading, but it shouldn't matter uh, because it's the audio, so we should be fine. Alto 2, I mute it. Alto 1, there we go. I mute that. And then you can kind of bring them back in gradually and let it render. So there they all go. And you would bring them in piece by piece, or you could do them all together. You may have to wait a long time for a render file or for it to render. Once again, you detach that audio. They're all down here and they're gone. And we're back to where we were before. Drag that Simple Grid X Pro in. So Simple Grid X Pro is amazing and it's really useful but it, uh, it's a resource hog. So when you do it, that's you're gonna really have to wait for it to render for everything to work. So you notice on our display here, we've got some boxes. All right, this is what you're going to use to space out your videos. You're gonna shrink them and fit them into these boxes. 
All right. So it defaults to like a three by three box thing here, which is four lines on each. If you go up here to this icon here, so if I was on something else, you click right here. This is going to bring up your parameters. The color is green, which works really well because it makes it nice and easy to see. Uh, it's just a guide for now. And you'll see vertical line is four and horizontal line is four. That's because there's four vertical lines. One, two, three, four, and four horizontal lines counting the top. One, two, three, four. You would change this to meet whatever specifications you need. I mean, you could you can make this anything. You know, if I made it 12 by 20, for example, I mean, I could have a ton. You know, you're going to use it as a guide for whatever you need. So before you do this part, you want to make sure you have everything planned out. How many of each instrument do you have? How many boxes do you need? Where do you want them to go? It's best to plan all of that out before you start taking these steps, these next steps that I'm going to show you. You want to have everything all set, maybe kind of storyboard it out on a piece of paper. Uh, for now, I only have five videos, so I'm just going to stick with this and uh, I'll put them in here in like kind of like a cross formation uh, when I'm ready to move, but you may have a ton of, of videos and you'll just have to do more, more boxes and more movement. So here we are. I've picked my diagram, my amount of boxes that I need or that I want, and I'm ready to start changing my videos to meet it. By the way, if you ever look and it's like a black screen, you have no idea what's going on, you've probably accidentally clicked off you know, your work area. Just move it over here and click and you have all your videos. So I'm going to highlight each of these videos. I can press shift to do it, or I can press, uh, I can just highlight it with a box, whatever you want, right? I'm gonna highlight them all, and I'm going to use the transform function. So transform can be found right here. Uh, this arrow here kind of, you can pick a few different things. We'll talk about cropping in a minute, but transform, when I click that and it's highlighted, I'm gonna now change everything about this video uh, and I'm gonna make it smaller. To do that, there's a little node here in the bottom corner, you can use either corner. Just drag it up on an angle and fit it to a box. So there it is. I fit to the box because I highlighted all of them, I've actually fit every video into this box. Right, so there's a few ways you could do it. You, I just did it with everybody, right? So like, see, here's my, my top video is showing. By the way, you could see we're rendering and I would be waiting because I just made a big change. I changed all those videos together. So you should wait until that render's done. Just gonna show you some stuff. If I press V on this guy, I'm gonna disappear. There's my alto too. If I press V, there I am on tenor. There's the second tenor and there I am on Barry. Right. They're all there stacked up on top of each other. You just only see the one because, once again, it's just all layered with this black background layered on the bottom. So that's rendering. I just moved it. So if I go back and kind of take this back to the full screen it was in before, you're like, I, I filmed this myself of me. I'm center camera for the most part. It's in a good spot. But if, say, I was somewhere else and you might want to go one video at a time and check it. So there's me everywhere else, right? It can look kind of confusing. So I'm just working with this top video or bottom video, or whatever video, I'm gonna mute the ones I don't need. So now I'm working with just myself. And let's say I wanted like a different camera angle. Maybe I didn't want all this stuff over here that microphone's obnoxious or something, right? You would, you know, mess with what you want to be in the frame. Uh, let's say I don't like my hair. I don't want to get rid of it, whatever you want to do. This is the frame, you want the frame to look like this, you're going to use the crop function. So you go to here, you go to crop, and now you can kind of crop out the image however you want it to look like that. This is really useful if kids are like off center from the camera. And then you click done, when you're done, and there it is. That's what the video would look like. I'm going to undo that because there's just no need for us to go through that process. Um, I'm going to click on all my videos. Once again, I'm going to go to the transform function right now to set the crop. There are two keyboard shortcuts that you are really going to want to know. Shift and T goes to transform and uh, Shift and C goes to crop. So my video here is still for whatever reason 
So there we go. Oh wow, I went back way too far. So four by four. All right, we're ready now. So now I'm gonna shrink all these videos. I highlight them all. I'm gonna shortcut the transform and I'm gonna bring them into that center box. Here we are. I, and you know, looks pretty good. You hit done and now we're done with that. They're all now shrunk to that center box. All right, now we're gonna go one by one and move them around. So here's my Alto One video. I just highlighted it. I'm gonna press Shift T or to go to the transform function. Make sure I'm in a spot. And when I click anywhere else, I can now move this video around. So if I want Alto One right here, I'm gonna center it, make sure it's good to go. And next I'll click on Alto Two, the next one down. And I'll move it down here. This is where I want my second alto to be. All right, it's there. Next tenor one, I click on it. I move it over to the side. Tenor two's here. We'll get it moved over here. And then the battery's already in its spot. So now when I play this, uh, we may want, need to wait for it to render for a second. So while it's rendering, I just like to say, you wanna make all of your adjustments to the videos before you start moving them around. Now, I like to put them in a center box and then go from there. Uh, you may need to go one video at a time, get the shot that you want in the box and then crop it and then move it to where it should be on the screen. If you have a lot of videos, you wanna make sure on a piece of paper, you plan out where all, every instrument in each section is gonna go and just kind of use it as a guide. It helps you keep track of everything. Uh, keeping everything in score order here is really important, at least in my opinion, just because you can find all of your sections really easy. So now you can see why I was saying this is gonna be your worst enemy because it just takes a while for things to render in Final Cut when you're working with a ton of videos, especially if you have some RAM issues and you have trouble running a lot of processes at once you know, this render thing is going to be a real drag. Uh, you'll notice too, if I tried to play this, once it got to here, it would all skip around and be out of out of place. But for now, just for time-saving purposes, I'm going to start the playback on this. So here's what it looks like. So that's just a little bit of what it looks like. And everything is already synced up because you already handled that in iMovie. So we're good to go. This is a performance. It, it's ready to go. You could have everybody on the screen. They're in their box. They're, you know, everything looks great. And you're ready to export because you made a performance that you're happy with. You may not, however, want this simple Grid X Pro these green lines to be there. So you have to do something with that. Now, often I just delete it. Uh, it drives me crazy because it's a memory hog, even though it's awesome because it helps you size these videos. But you can do something with it. Uh, you, first of all, you can change the line thickness. You can make them a little thicker and then you can change the color and black works really well. It'll kind of make like a separation between all your parts and kind of clean everything up and make it look good. So let's say we want to leave that and there's a nice little black line there. By the way, in order to do that, you have to make sure you have it highlighted. I'm gonna make the line thickness a little more and see there's like a good separation now between all those videos because of those black lines. Uh, once this rendered and you know you were ready to export and you like the performance and everything, uh, you would either get rid of the Simple Grid X Pro, change the lines, uh, and the last thing you want to do, uh, well, there's two things actually. You want to check the sound one more time. I can't stress it. I'm always adamant about checking the sound on these videos. So how, do, how you're going to check sound, you can pull up the levels. You need to go to Window up here, and you need to go to Show in Workspace, and you want the audio meters to show in your workspace. You click that in this bottom right hand corner here. Now you've got a nice little master track audio meter thing. When you're listening to your file, you'll see it's reading you know, the audio signal. So 
So you want your sound to push zero. You want it to get close to there, but you never want it to go past it. That's clipping. It's just one last test of clipping before you're ready to export. You should be fine if you followed all the instructions and really check for clipping when you're working in Logic. But let's say you wanted to change the volume of your performance track. When I click on it, it usually automatically brings you to this. If not, if it goes to something else, you just click this little volume button here. And right here where it says volume, you can use this slider to move your volume up and down, louder and softer, and you would just experiment. Now, I'm pretty confident that what I exported from Final Cut was fine, which is, you know, double zero. By the way, you could type it in to the levels, either negative or just not negative to move it louder, whoever you want. But you always want to check that and listen through the performance to make sure everything is where it needs to be. So, and after that, you need to get rid of the count off. Obviously, you, you probably don't want a count off on your final performance. So I'm gonna move this cursor to the beginning of the song and I'm gonna hold command and I'm gonna press plus. And that's gonna allow me to zoom in. As I zoom in, I kind of navigate down here so I can see it and I can see the count off right there. I, I can zoom in a little more even more so and here's where the tune's starting here's the count off you can do one of two things you can get rid of the count off by kind of clicking on this spot here making sure your cursor's here and this audio track is highlighted and once it's there you just press command b which stands for blade and i've made a little cut here and you would just delete this spot before now it's gone. You can kind of see a little hint of a count off there. You just move this up. You can kind of edge it out using the uh, bottom left hand of your sound. And it's there. All right, so to zoom out, command minus sign, and you'll zoom out of your project a little bit. Um, you can see even now it's still rendering this ending here. So that's it. You have your whole performance and you're ready to export and you're kind of just ready to move on and work on other stuff or whatever you want. But if you want to do more, before we go through the exporting process here, there's two things that you could do to kind of make your videos look a lot nicer. Uh, one is pop-ins and pop-outs. So let's say a part of the song, a section's featured and you only want them on the screen. You don't want the other players on the screen. You have to find that spot in the song where you want it. So I have this here. So there's a spot in the song where just the low people play. So it's right there. So let's say on that spot, and I'll zoom in a little bit so I can see it. Here it is right here. I want just the low saxes to be seen. So I'm gonna go right before where that is, and you need to make a break in all of your parts. You're gonna use that Command B function for blade. I go to the spot I want, all the tracks are highlighted. Command B, now there's a break here. Right, you have to also go to the end. Sometimes it's helpful to do the end first, especially if you're gonna do more changes and you wanna keep this video size. So let's say right about there is where I want everybody back in. So I stop right before that spot, highlight all of my tracks, all right, and I press Command B, and now I have a break right here. So now what I heard was the low people played and then the high people played. Right there. So I'm gonna make another break right before that spot. And here, we're just I have everything highlighted already, and there's a break. So right here at this spot, this is where the low people are playing. So I'm gonna click on Alto 2 and Alto 1, and I'm gonna press V, and they are gonna go bye-bye. All right, so now right here, when this spot pops up, just the low saxes, the two tenors and the battery are gonna play. Uh, it might not because it's rendering, but we'll see what happens. 
gold, right? And there goes the other saxes, right? So you can really get creative with this if you want. So like here, I would make another break. Right there, so I'll make another break here. And you can kind of just keep putting all these changes in and picking who you want wherever. So. so here, once again, I'm going to get rid of the altos. And here I'm going to get rid of the tenor and Barry for no real apparent reason. And you'll see what happens. <clears throat> it's just going to change who's on the screen depending on who's muted. So you make these partitions you know, by highlighting all the parts, pressing Command-B uh, for blade, and then muting the parts you don't want. So once again, it's still rendering, but we'll see what happens. So it doesn't really make sense. Uh, you would obviously organize it better than I did. I just kind of random made it random, but yeah, that's just the idea of what you can do. Uh, the last thing you probably want to do is add a title. Uh, this there's there are many titles that work so you see where your count off was it's a good time to put a title in your song or if you want it before any of these screens pop up you're gonna need to add another black background and then put the title on top of that so once again you go to the T here solids custom and drag this to the very beginning of the song all right, so once again, everything that happened, everything that you did is attached to this primary storyline here. So I added a black background before, so I had some more room, but it didn't change anything. It's all there. So I'll just, I just need to give myself some space to put a title. I have it right here. And now I'm going to go find a title. Under here, title, there's tons of options. Uh, let's just say we'll use boogie lights, pretty fancy. Uh, I'm going to drag it right here. It should go, you might want it on top of everything, but it's up to you. And you see when my cursor's here and I have this highlighted, uh, I can double click it and it'll bring up some options. Usually when you double click it, it'll take you right to the text. There's all kinds of things you can change. You can also double click the text here and we'll just say that this is demo song. I type demo song. There it is you'll see it's kind of bleeding into my performance, which is okay because there's this empty space here where the saxes are popping up and it'll still say demo song. If you wanted to disappear by then, it just get rid of it up until that point. So here's our title. And let's just say we wanted to end with the same title. I can click it, copy it with command C, take it to the end of the song. The song's done right about here. All right, you can kind of drag to see where it is and press V and now it's this demo song. And then I have a little extra room at the back. It doesn't have to line up right when it ends. So once this all renders, you would have a complete performance that you could watch. Uh, you wanna let it render before you export it, but this is it. This is the whole show here, the whole little snippet with our somewhat random pop in and pop outs here. We've got titles, every track is put in a spot where you can see it, we use the transform function to do that. Now we're ready to export. Back end, everything rendered out, and I cleaned this area up here where we had these pop in and pop outs to try to make it a little bit more musical uh, while I was waiting. So now this would be ready to export. You'd wanna check it over one more time. We'll watch the whole thing, kind of go over everything that's happening. When we had five videos we put in, we added a black background on our primary storyline, our master audio beneath, the five videos on top, and we use the transform function to shrink each of those videos into a square on the screen with the simple Grid X Pro. Uh, to help us size them. And we're going to do some pop ins and pops out, pop outs. I use that with the uh, command B function to make partitions in all the tracks. And then I picked which ones were going to be muted and which ones weren't. And we added, finally added some titles here at the beginning and the end. Uh, 
pretty flashy there for what this is, but here's what the whole thing looks like. And that's it. That's the whole project. Uh, you don't need to move the cursor to the beginning. I just do because I'm superstitious. You make sure everything is rendered out. If you're happy with everything, you're ready to export it. To do that, you jump up here to this icon in the upper right of your screen. You want to export as a master file. You're looking for the highest quality, which unfortunately is also the biggest one here. So it's named demo song. You name it whatever you want. I usually don't deal with descriptions, creators, or even tags. It's up to you. It'll tell you about how big it is. This little chunk here of music was 1.32 gigabytes, so it gets pretty big. It's going to export it as a .mov file. Once I'm happy with everything, I click Next. I decide where I'm going to you know, put it on my computer, maybe rename it, actually. And so I decide on my desktop. I hit Save. And now it will begin the exporting process, which can take a while. Uh, this isn't that big of a file, so it's not too bad. It's moving along pretty good. Once it's done, at least on my computer, uh, the uh, QuickTime will automatically open it, and you can look at it there uh, just to make sure it's good. But then it's your file. You can move it around, do whatever you want with it. You make multiple ones of these and you can kind of combine them together in a concert. So that's about everything. I hope this helped you out. Uh, I hope you have a much better idea of how virtual performances are made or done and uh, you could follow this step by step. I highly recommend checking out the instructions I made. Uh, there's a link to it in the description. It kind of takes you through every single part of this tutorial and outlines everything in detail in text form. You can just follow along with that with your own files. All right, guys, hope this helped you out. Uh, good luck making your virtual performances. Take care and have a good one. Bye-bye.